morning, everybody. Good morning. Wanted to say, but um, before I got started, that I'm particularly thankful for that prayer um, that Jesus taught us to pray: "Forgive us our iniquities." Um, just think of that as uh, even just as I come up here to speak. Uh, to you all, that I need, apart from Jesus, I have nothing, and um, I'm in full need of, of Jesus' forgiveness and of his salvation, and it's through that work that um, I do come and, and speak. Um, as Barack was saying last week, we started an Advent sermon series uh, that will be running through the weeks of December, culminating on Christmas Eve, and we're preaching through the Gospel of Luke, um, chapters 1, verse 26 through 220, um, the birth narrative of, of Christ. Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which means coming, and it symbolizes a waiting for um, the coming king who would establish his kingdom. Uh, part of the reason for the Advent series was just excitement to be focusing on the coming of Christ and, and preaching on these texts together. Um, and also just thinking of, I think we could all use a little more of the Christmas spirit, uh, especially in the times and the years that we've come through. Uh, last week we started by looking at the beginning of Luke, uh, verses 1 through 4, it's the very beginning of the book, where Luke says his purpose in writing uh, for a man named Most Excellent Theophilus. Um, he says that he was writing these things and he compiled this orderly narrative so that Theophilus might have certainty of the things that had taken place among them. And as we approach this Christmas time, there are many things that are often searched for around this time. A fun time, good time with family, giving and receiving gifts, that Christmassy feeling, nostalgia, celebrating traditions, and those things are all well and good and are blessings from God, but uh, we should thank, and we should thank God for every one of them. But as we read through these accounts over the next several weeks, um, let's remember that we're not here for nostalgia, we're not here for celebrating traditions, even though we are, but we're here for certainty. That your heart may have a firm ground to stand on. That my heart may have a firm ground to stand on. And that's the word of God. Um, and we gather to hear from God's word. Part of my devotions this week was um, reading <coughs> some of Charles Spurgeon's uh, Psalms commentary. Spurgeon was an 1800s preacher. Uh, and I came across this phrase that I thought was particularly helpful for how we think about Advent. Uh, and in Psalm 6, after David cries, O oh Lord, how long? Um, Spurgeon says this The coming of Christ into the soul in his priestly robes of grace is the grand hope of the penitent soul. And indeed, in some form or other, Christ's appearance is and ever has been the hope of the saints. Um, so as we think about Advent, as we uh, look at Christ's coming, we hope for so much more than that. We hope for the coming of Christ into our souls um, even more strongly and tenderly. If you do not know Jesus, Advent is about Jesus coming into your heart. Um, and if you do know Jesus, it's about uh, experiencing a greater and even fuller reality of that, knowing Christ even more deeply. So as we looked uh, last week at verses 26 through 23 of Luke chapter 1, and you can please turn there, uh, with the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Mary, and how he announced that she would bear a son, that uh, he would be great, uh, we saw that this story didn't start with this story, but it actually started 500 years earlier when the angel Gabriel comes to um, the prophet Daniel. 
And the angel Gabriel describes that to Daniel that there would be a coming king. And he tells him of the coming kingdom of God. Uh, this week we're going to finish that story with uh, more of what Gabriel says that, um, about who Jesus will be. And also Mary's response to God's word. Um, let, let's begin in prayer as we, uh, before we read our text. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have um, come to us. Lord, you were, uh, you, you came to dwell among us. You came to be um, incarnated, to come in the flesh, um, to dwell among us. Uh, thank you that you even come into our hearts, Lord. Uh, thank you that you have sanctified and cleansed us and that we have come to know you and to know your gospel. Uh, we praise you, Lord. We thank you for the salvation that you come to give to us. And Lord, it is in that hope that we stand. It's in that hope that we rejoice. And it's in that hope that we look forward to your coming as our king, uh, with your kingdom. Um, and so we wait, Lord, for that day. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Restore all things. Um, come as, as the righteous king. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. Let's read verses um, 26 through 38. Just to get the whole sense of the passage. But we're going to go back and start in verse 34. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came and to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will receive, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month of her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. At this point in this story where we're picking up in verse 34, Gabriel has greeted Mary uh, as one who has God's grace upon her. He's announced to her that... Um, He's announced to her that she would have a son, that this son would be the Savior. Uh, and he's also described what kind of child this would be. That he would be great, that he would be the son of the Most High. And that's a title reserved exclusively for Jesus in the scriptures. Uh, that this would be a rare kind of child. Uh, a a one-of-a-kind sort of child. The son of the Most <coughs> High God. Deity. Jesus is, is no ordinary person. Um, even from his birth, he is claimed to be completely and utterly different from us, and yet he is one of us. It is told uh, uh, to Mary that the Father would give the very kingdom of God to him, just as it was told in the book of Daniel when Gabriel visited the prophet Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, um, 
the one like a son of man comes to the ancient of days, that is God the Father, and he is given a kingdom. We're told from Gabriel the, the scope of what Jesus' reign would be, that he would reign over all the house of Israel, over the kingdom of Jacob. And we're also told the longevity of this kingdom, uh, that this child is the king. And his kingdom is to be a forever kingdom. As, um, and in speaking of, of the duration of this kingdom as eternal, he's really pointing to the ultimacy of this kingdom. This is the bright sun of all kingdoms. This is God's kingdom itself. And last week we talked about how Jesus died and how he uh, rose from the dead. And it's at that point after Jesus' death and resurrection that Jesus ascends into heaven and takes the very throne of God. God gave Jesus the very throne of God because Jesus is God. So let's turn to the text and, and look at uh, verse 34 and, and pick up back with the story. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? So Mary responds to the angel. We're, we're told here her first words to the angel. We saw her inner thoughts before, how she was greatly troubled, and how she was seeking to discern what sort of greeting this was. Maybe I was a little bit uh, inconsiderate of her or inconsiderate of the text last week when I said that maybe she screamed because she was greatly troubled. I was thinking about that. I, well... <laughs> Uh, because she, we're told that she sought to discern what sort of greeting this was. Uh, and so while alarmed, we're, while, while she is greatly troubled, we're also seeing a sense of composure in this uh, teenage girl stemming from her wisdom that even at such a young age, uh, and if that, um, that even though she was troubled, she was not frantic. Um, and that, that um, points to us too that in the midst of troubles or in the midst of um, things unknown we are to stand in faith we're, we're not to get frantic but to stand firm in, in faith um, Mary's question um, Mary's question is how shall this be? This is not like Zechariah's question, uh, because Zechariah also questioned Gabriel, but Zechariah's question is a little bit different. Zechariah's question is, how will I know that this shall be? How will I know that this is going to happen? Whereas um, Mary's question is, is uh, how is God going to do this? The... the the manner of how that was going to place, take place, not where as Zachariah is questioning the very fact that it would take place. Mary is talking about, Mary's question is, uh, I like what one um, really early commentary, pre-12th century commentary, uh, church father said um, her, that, that her, her question arises from admiration rather than distrust of God. Her heart is already marveling and trusting and believing in God's word. Yes, she questions, but her questioning is a, a tell me more kind of questioning, a searching into the glory of, the prom of God's promise to her that she would bear this child. What kind, of, um, what kind of questioning does your heart do to God's word? Does God's word both satisfy you and make you hungrier to search for more and to long for more? Do you want to know more of Jesus? Or, or do you question the very legitimacy of, of it all in unbelief? Um, so her question is legitimate. And as we said last week, the, the Gospels are arranged, each Gospel is arranged, arranged very carefully and intentionally by the, the, the authors. And as we look through the first couple of um, 
chapters in Luke, Luke keeps bringing up the faith of Mary and going back to, um, and we get little glimpses of how Mary is responding to all of these things. Um, and just a couple verses later, when she goes to Elizabeth, her cousin who's conceived a little girl, Elizabeth praises her for how she has believed the word of the Lord. So Gabriel's response to her, Gabriel answers her question. He doesn't rebuke her as he rebukes Zechariah, but he responds kindly and satisfyingly to her question. Uh, he answers her question, he says, and gives her more information. Uh, he does not completely resolve the mystery, uh, but he um, gives her more information of the mystery, because this is still very mysterious. He says um, in verse 35, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Mary's told that the Holy Spirit himself will do this work, that the Spirit of God would come upon her. Um, the very one, uh, the very power of the one in whom there is no higher power would come upon her. God would do this mighty work. Mary says, how will this be? And he says, since, since, since I am a virgin, and Gabriel says, yes, yes, you are a virgin. And the very power of God is going to do something in you and through you. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit would come upon one of God's people, they would do amazing things for, the, for God's kingdom. I think of Samson. When the Holy Spirit came upon Samson, he was a man of great power. And what strength was given to his hands uh, so that he burst bonds like straw and he slaughtered thousands of Israel's Philistine enemy armies and so forth. Or the instances when the spirit would come upon certain people and they would prophesy the very words of God. God's word would come forth from their very own mouths. God's authoritative word. And that's what he did through the prophets. That is, even as we proclaim what God has done with the very Bible, we believe that Scripture is both from men, penned by men, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that what men were doing uh, was also a work that God was doing in and through them. Um, what they could not do the coming of the Spirit upon them made them to be able to do. And what I want us to see is that uh, what was produced by men's actions included men's actions, but was actually so much more than men's actions. They were doing God's work. Uh, they were actually participating in God's work that God was doing in the world and doing what they could not do. And that's actually what we see here, too, with Mary. God takes Mary, he takes her virginity uh, through her own womb, her own body, and produces what her body could not do. Mary carries in her womb her own, uh, the, the Son of God. Her own body nourishes the eternal Son of God. And there's a parallel here to the Spirit's work in our lives as well. God seeks to use us, uh, to use our hands, and perhaps <laughs> especially to use our mouths uh, through the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit is upon us to do so much more than what we could possibly do. What power there is in the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. Uh, the same truth applies to us in our lives. Can it be? That as you speak words of truth to your brother or sister, or as you take care of them in love, um, that 
they should grow to be more like Jesus and that God should use you to help them to be more like Jesus? Can you do that? Can your words that you speak save anyone? How can what is earthly and human bring about a work that is spiritual of the Holy Spirit and heavenly? We need to know uh, that we are completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit to produce anything godly. God must work this in you. If the Spirit is not in our work, we produce nothing spiritual. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing so that we would know our complete dependency upon him for everything. We must know this as a church too, brothers and sisters. Pray for the Spirit's work, the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Because if God does not come with his pitcher, with the water of the Spirit to pour down on our works, how will we grow? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, Paul said, I planted, he's talking about his ministry, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And what great things were done. Uh, also, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church in Acts chapter 2, um, on the day of Pentecost, following much prayer and, and, and faith. Um, so by the Spirit, through faith, Mary participates in the kingdom work of God and gives birth to God. Mary, the text says, will be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, God's power. And this imagery of, uh, is often associated with God's very own presence. forget which author it was, but one of them said, uh, Mary's womb becomes a temple of the Almighty. <clears throat> and that leads us to the result, the result of the Holy Spirit's work uh, we also see. Uh, notice the result of this amazing work of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel says, therefore, uh, because of the Holy Spirit's work on this birth, therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. Um, holy. Jesus will be called holy. Uh, this word is easy to pass over, but it's very significant because here something is proclaimed about Jesus that is utterly unique about the son of God in comparison with the rest of humanity. He is a child who is born holy. And to really get the sense of what this means, you have to go back and look at the other uses of the word holy. Uh, word holy. And as an aside, a great Bible study tool uh, is BibleGateway.com. That's just one way you can do this. You can just type in the word holy and you'll get, it's a concordance that brings up all of the passages that uses that word. So you can you can look and see, okay, well, where else is this word holy used? And you can do that with any other word. Um, and I mention that just because um, uh, I also want to help us uh, learn to, to, to do these things uh, as, as well. Um, but in looking through those other uses, you see that um, the word holy is used of um, the things that are connected immediately to God, to God himself. God is the holy of holy. Uh, God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who, who is and was and is to come. It is used most particularly in the temple setting, the very presence of God. So God's presence is a place of holiness. Um, it is used of all the vessels in the temple. Um, 
uh, and, and, and even God's people were to become holy. But one thing that is most important is that not one of the Israelites, um, not one of the Israelites was ever holy, or at least innately so. God's people were, were made holy, they were called to be holy, but not innately holy. Uh, and every year, the highest and the holiest person in all of Israel, the high priest, had to enter the most holy place in the temple, uh, and that he could only do once a year uh, to uh, make a sacrifice and shed blood for the sins of, uh, of himself and also for all the people. So even the holiest person in Israel needs to be made holy. And yet Jesus is conceived and born completely holy. Jesus is the sinless, pure, spotless Lamb of God. He is not like David who says of, him, of himself, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, Psalm 51 verse 5 says. Actually, the true David is the one who was not brought forth in iniquity, and whose mother did not conceive him in sin. And this was so, so that Jesus could obey the law perfectly for us, uh, in our place, and that he would be our high priest that did not need to have anyone make atonement for him, and so that he could be our one true mediator, the mediator between God and men, and so that he, being the spotless and unblemished lamb, could offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews 7, 26 says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Brothers and sisters, we worship a sinless Christ, a sinless Jesus, because we have a God in whom there is no darkness at all, 1 John 1, five says. And so Jesus is born of the agency of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he is a child that is perfectly holy and perfectly pure. The second thing that we see is that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, as a result of his birth being from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and at this point, I think it's important that we discuss the, both the deity and the humanity of Christ. Because it's very evident here that, that what is proclaimed about Christ is both his humanity, he's being born of Mary, but also that he is a child produced by the Holy Spirit from the virginity of Mary, called the Son of God. He's both Son of Mary and Son of God. Jesus is both God and man. Now before I uh, want to uh, or seek to exp um, talk about these things, we must first marvel at these things. How is it that the infinite became finite? How is it that he who is spirit without body not of creation, became, as, as John says, the word became flesh. How is it that he who is immutable, without change, became a changeable creature? In fact, in need of change. The eternal, timeless Son of God begins to grow as a baby and have birthdays. The omnipotent, all-powerful God, mighty God, takes on the extreme fragility of a tiny little newborn baby. That the one who has no beginning comes to be, to be conceived and to be born. The one who is holy, 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 immeasurably 
and infinitely distant from us in his holiness would draw near to us and come to us in the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans 8.3 says. Entering into this sinful, um, God-hating world. John 1.5 says, The light shines in the darkness. Jesus, who is the light, comes into the darkness. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That he who is invisible would become visible. That we might know and see God himself. The world asks and sometimes scoffs and says, where is your invisible God? And in some sense, we can say right here, Jesus, Jesus is God. See how holy and glorious he is. Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And he also says, I and the Father are one. These are uh, amazing and mysterious things that we ought to uh, marvel upon and, and contemplate. Um, uh, it's important for us to know that we as a church are very dependent upon our brothers and sisters in Christ that came before us. And as a church of God, we're not completely independent uh, from those who have gone before us, but have a rich history, a rich family lineage, which is a great blessing to us. The Holy Spirit working on all previous generations of, of Christians. And so church history is really important because, um, uh, and we want to honor that fact that God has worked through Christians. Uh, all through the ages. And really, we are deeply indebted to previous generations for their articulation, for their deep, deep contemplation, their marveling of such great doctrines such as the Trinity, the attributes of God, and the Incarnation. I love what one of my professors says. He's, and he is quoting some of the great theologians in history who used to say this, uh, in that... In theology, oftentimes when statements on the Trinity or the Incarnation or any other thing uh, related to God is not to explain away the mystery, but to preserve the mystery, uh, lest we make it something lesser or other than what the scriptures say. And so there's several things that we learn from church history, and I think this is an important point to just show the intersection of this text with uh, church history. Um, that we must take great care in how we articulate the, the deity and humanity of Christ, lest we err into heresy. Uh, and they also teach us to treasure these things. But here's what we need to know about uh, the doctrines of the Trinity and, um, and the Incarnation. Um, that uh, these were massive issues in the early church, in the first 400 years of Christianity. Uh, the doctrines of the Trinity and subsequently the deity and humanity of Christ or the expression of the incarnation um, were the first and primary issues to come under intense attack by uh, heretics. But those attacks caused the church to have to respond to these things and articulate uh, these things. And the church even pronounced those who differed on these things as anathema or, or cursed, as heretics, meaning not of the true church of God and proclaiming ultimately a, a different God, deviating from the true and holy faith of, uh, of the scriptures. I know that when I start talking about church history, for some of you, this may be the complete antithesis of uh, feeling Christmassy. But just bear, bear with me a little bit. Um, 
But one, one heretic was named Nestorius. He was an early uh, 400s um, uh, pastor, and he was teaching that, we're, that there were really two persons in Christ. There was the eternal Son of God that was in Christ, but also alongside of him, there was the Son of David um, that was, and both of them, the, the eternal Son of God and the Son of Man, or Son of David, were dwelling together in one body. For this reason, he refused to say that Mary was the mother of God. Uh, he refused to say that uh, Mary was um, the bearer of God because of what his um, thoughts were on this. But even in, in these verses here, or, or as we will see next week, that um, Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of our Lord. Arius was another heretic. Uh, feels weird to say that word, uh, but false teacher, you could say, in the 300s that taught that Jesus was not really God, but Jesus was really the highest and most supreme created being of God, really an angel. And he was pronounced a heretic at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Uh, and this, this, that teaching is... Uh, primarily what still what still separates us apart from the Jehovah's Witness because um, Jehovah's Witness are really like a modern day Arianism which was condemned in 325 at the first council of Nicaea because they do not believe that Jesus is God that he shares deity with God So ecumenical councils were called. These were church-wide uh, gatherings of both the East and West Church at the time, where a gathering of all the pastors and bishops uh, were called together to meet to discuss these issues and to produce and set forth statements of what was the true doctrine. And if that any church was not teaching these things about God and Christ, they were not teaching the true doctrine. Uh, and so there were... Um, Seven of these, or possibly a little bit more, but the fourth, the fourth of these ecumenical councils was the, called the Council of Chalcedon. It was in um, 451, and it was to produce a statement on the deity and humanity of Christ. Uh, theologians recognize that while this statement is subject to error because it was made by men, the church, however, has never been able to move to a better articulation of what was produced there, or to move past it, or to improve upon it. And this is the doctrine that we hold about Christ, even to this day. And for, for me, it's, it's comforting to know that we have a historic faith. That we have a, a, a faith that goes way back, um, and is uh, <coughs> articulated in history. So I want to read that Chalcedonian Creed, it's called. Uh, for us. Um, again, this is on the two natures of Christ. Um, that Christ has both a divine and human nature. Uh, so let's, I'm going to read that now. It says, So, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one voice teach the confession of one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same, perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity. He is, they're saying he's one person, not two. The same truly God and truly man, of a rational soul and a body, of one essence with the Father as regards his divinity, and the same of the one essence with us as regards his humanity. Like us in all respects, except for sin, begotten before the ages from the Father as regards his divinity, and in the last days for us and for our salvation, the same born of Mary, the virgin God-bearer, as regards his humanity, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures, uh, 
uh, natures unconfusedly, uh, natures unchangeably, meaning nothing happens to his human nature, nothing happens to his divine nature, neither is altered, neither is changed. and inseparably and indivisibly. The difference of the natures being in no way removed because of the union. And it goes on a little bit further, but I think we get the point um, there. Um, again, this does not explain the mystery away, but seeks to preserve the mystery. So we've talked about Jesus' holiness his uniqueness, uh, the two natures of Jesus. He is God and man, and how church history has intersected with that in a major way. Now let's finish the story here. Gabriel says to um, Mary, he says, And behold, your relative in her old age has also conceived. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So the angel Gabriel points to Elizabeth's pregnancy and her barrenness almost as an uh, example or, or prototype of the even greater reality that would happen with her. That she who is called barren Elizabeth is having a child. God can do anything. Uh, nothing is impossible with God. And Mary models to us a response, and the response that we should have to God's word, both of belief and faith. She hears the word of the Lord, and she does it. Uh, this is the way of salvation, the path that we are commanded to walk on. We, like Mary, are to hear God's word, and we are to obey it. We are to believe it. We are to do God's word. Um, we are to have the holiness without which no one will see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14 says. She also models to us uh, a self-perception that, that she has and a, and a humility. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. We are either... The servant of Jesus, or the servant of the Lord, or we are a slave of the world. And she, as we uh, said earlier, she participates in the kingdom work through her humility, faith, and obedience. She participates in the work of God. Um, she does a natural thing, having a baby, but is participating in a supernatural she does an ordinary thing. I don't mean to diminish what happens with uh, pregnancy or having a baby. But, uh, but God is working in her an extraordinary thing. Even the birth of the Holy Savior of the world. And so uh, the angel of the Lord departed from her. As we come to celebrate communion together, um, we come to the purpose of the incarnation. Jesus coming to us came for this purpose, um, so that he might give himself for us. Uh, so I'd like to invite the um, servers to come forward.
heard a familiar story this morning about reminding us of one we've heard many, many times of the Savior who was going to come. We live on the other side of history where the Savior has already come. But we're trying to go back through this story because we've heard it so many times we don't want to lose the value of it. So today as we kind of build to the crescendo that we'll see on Christmas Eve of the child, the Christ child being born, today we remember that time that he is coming. But he wasn't just coming to just be born a baby. He wasn't just coming, as Jesse said, the Christmas tradition, I think, is probably the favorite for many of us. It's one of my favorite times of the year, as it probably is for a lot of you. Christmas music starts in my life about July 1st, and I can listen through it throughout the rest of the year. It's great. We light candles, and we light lights on trees to remind us of the curse that came on a tree and the promise that came through the message of an angel speaking to shepherds and to Mary and Elizabeth. But it doesn't all just end there. We celebrate the coming of that baby because of what we read of the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians later. He says that we take of the meal that we're going to celebrate today, remembering all that Jesus did, fulfilling all the prophecies that he's fulfilling through the process that Jesse walked through today, fulfilling all the prophecies as he would as a young baby into a young man and then later as an adult too. We remember all of those things, but then the final words of the Apostle Paul, he says, until he comes. And so today we celebrate the communion because the Christ child came in a manger. We also celebrate because he died on the cross, rose from the grave, and has given us a promise that one day he'll return. So I hope today as we have communion together that we'll celebrate in remembrance of all that Jesus has done and let our confession be that he's coming again. And we celebrate the hope that we have in him on this earth until he comes. So with that, I'd like us to ask this morning to thank the Lord for the bread. And so now would you thank the Lord for the bread before we take it? Father, we come this morning with grateful hearts. Grateful hearts for the gift that you brought. The salvation we have. Only through your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that this bread represents your body, that you freely gave up in obedience to the Father, that we might spend eternity with you. In your holy name. Christmas story is so beautiful because it's so full of promises and miracles and then word pictures. We know later from the story, as we'll get there on Christmas Eve night when we read through Luke chapter 2, 
that it says because of some things that some earthly king thought that he was in control of, that Mary and Joseph went to the town of Bethlehem, the house of bread. And in the town of the house of bread, what Bethlehem means in Hebrew, there would be one who would be born that would one day, who would say, I am the bread of life. 30 years after that, he would stand with his disciples in a room, like we're gathered in a room here. And when he said, as the bread of life, born in the, ho in the house of bread, the city of bread, this is my body, the bread of life, torn and broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. On the same night that Jesus tore that bread, symbolizing a broken, broken body, it says he took of a cup and he held that communal cup and he passed it to his disciples and says, this is the cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Without that cup, we have no hope. Without the blood that was shed that that cup symbolized, we have no hope. And so today, let's thank the Lord for the covenant that was celebrated through the giving of that cup. Jesse, would you take a look for us? Lord Jesus, thank you that, um, Lord, you're, you shed your blood for us, Lord. Lord, thank you that uh, you were not only born holy, Lord, but you came to make us holy, Lord. Lord, and your blood is what makes us holy to stand before you, unblemished. Thank you, Lord, for this, this, your great gift, Lord. We praise you for uh, your salvation. And Lord, we pray, uh, as Jude prayed, now to him who is able to keep you from uh, stumbling and to present you holy, uh, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Lord, keep us. Uh, we thank you for our holiness. Let us know our holiness through the blood of Jesus. And Lord, keep us holy. Keep us and, and present us blameless before your presence, Lord, with great joy. Uh, in your name we pray.
intentionally used the words before we took the cup, communal. Because so often we get wrapped up in, and I love, and as you've heard from this morning, Jesse and I both love history and the way things were done in the early church. But a lot of places you'll hear that that's not the way they did it then, that's not the way they did it then, that's not the way they did it. We get so wrapped up on looking exactly like it once did. We don't have communal cups today for lots of reasons. But it doesn't matter. Because the blood within the covenant is what truly ties us together. It's not taking of the same cup. Jesus said this is the cup of the new covenant. The blood within was what ties us to the Father. It's what ties us to the Son. It's what fills us with the Spirit because of the shed blood of Christ. So this morning, as we take of that cup, let us remember that this truly is the tie that binds, the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. I believe, like each time that we've celebrated the Lord's Supper, since I've been with you, that we've always sung a song, and I've said these words, that on those nights that Jesus ate the bread and took of the cup with his disciples, they left singing a hymn. You guys have been doing that for a very long time. So if you would stand, let's sing the hymn that we're used to, Blessed Be the Time. together with the Father through the shed blood of the Son and with each other. I'd like to invite you now over to the next room as we fellowship together as one family and then later after that we'll have Sunday school where we'll dig deeper into the message as you heard this message or this morning. So if you come celebrate fellowship with me and then I'll see you in Sunday school in a little while.